Hi everyone, this is Kevin Annie Eagle Strong Voice again. I am giving you today a sermon for the third Sunday in Advent. That's the upcoming Sunday, December 15th, 2019. And this is part of an ongoing series called God's Revolution, a radical reading of scripture for refugees from false religion. It's sponsored by the Covenanters, a separatist political and spiritual movement. Today's gospel is taken from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. It's sometimes called Mary's Song of Praise, announcing the birth of Jesus, or the Magnificat. But I call today's sermon an outcast's victory, the world turned upside down. And when you read Mary's words, and you go back to the original Greek, once again, you get a very different message from what you see printed in the Bible. Mary's words are, My soul grows and rejoices, for in my poverty I am chosen to do great things. Because of me, rulers are pulled down from their thrones and destroyed, and the lowly are raised up and exalted. The hunger are filled with all that is good, and the rich are banished and sent away empty. Well, all of this reminded me of a woman named Karen Connerly. Karen was someone who people tried not to notice, especially in church. She was poor and bedraggled, she was Aboriginal and pregnant, and she was barely 16 years old. On the morning we met, Karen stood tentatively on the edge of our congregation with a look of what I thought at the time was fear. In fact, she had arrived that day to overturn our world. At the time, I had been the minister of St. Andrew's United Church in Port Alberni for barely a year, and my life seemed wonderful, content and happy. Our Port Alberni congregation had tripled in size, and everyone seemed quite content. They were especially delighted on Sundays when my t little infant daughter, Eleanor, used to toddle to the front of the service during my sermon and insist that I pick her up. So I'd stand there and preach with Eleanor in my arms, and that delighted especially the elderly ladies in the congregation. Now, at the time in my joy, I couldn't imagine how that was all about to change forever. Well, when Karen Connerly appeared that Sunday in our church in the fall of 1993, it didn't really alarm a lot of us at first because a few local Indians had already begun to attend the service. The local New Chelmuth Indians had begun to accept my invitation to come to church, but they were mostly affluent natives. They were tribal council people, and they kept to themselves, which pretty much suited my white parishioners just fine. As for me, I was feeling pretty proud of myself that I had been able to seat Indians alongside whites, which was the first in our church, and to have Indians and whites sitting together on Sundays. It was also a first anywhere in Port Alberni. Even though at the time, despite feeling that pride, I didn't know the conditions, the homegrown slaughter that my own church had perpetrated on the local natives that was responsible for that ongoing apartheid in our community. Well, Karen Connerly changed all of that. She did it in the way anyone does who is living on the edge and can't afford to hide the truth by being polite or considerate. Well, I knew something was afoot when Karen walked into the church and she didn't sit down with the rest of us after her opening hymn. She stood at the back of the sanctuary and just stared at me. One of the ushers went up and spoke to her, but she shook her head and, and barked something that made heads turn. I was weighing what to do when suddenly she began shuffling towards me at the front of the church, and even before her wailing began, I could see that she was crying. Her words rocked the church. She cried out, They killed my baby! They killed my little Charlie! Well, at that point, an usher named George Geddes got up, and he went over to the woman and actually put her in an arm lock. And the congregation exploded at that point in cries and shouts of outrage. Of course, I didn't know if they were outraged at what she was doing or what George was doing to her. Anyway, she tried to wrestle free, but another guy got up, grabbed her as well. And at that point, I just came down out of the pulpit. I hurried to them because I was dumbstruck that men that I thought I knew were perpetrating such sudden violence on this little Indian woman. I got the ushers to back off. I guided Karen to an empty pew, and I sat her down, and then I asked everyone around me to just sit down and calm down. Well, Ka Karen then poured out her, her story to me. She described what had happened, and people sat in a stony silence while others got up and hurried out of the church. I was advised later by my board that I should have let George and his buddies manhandle the inconvenient Indian out of church so that the service could have continued in peace. But even then, as obtuse as I was, 
I knew that something else, something more important was at work than just church business as usual. Karen Connerly was a single mother. She lived on welfare in the midtown slum area of Port Bernie that's still called the ghetto. It's where mostly Indians live. She'd been raped by her father and by uncles at the local Seychad Indian Reservation, and so she lived in hiding in the ghetto with her one-year-old, daughter, one-year-old son, Charlie, and her newborn daughter, the one who was not yet born in her womb. One day, little Charlie began to cough uncontrollably, and soon he turned blue and went into convulsions. So, in a panic, Karen carried him up to West Coast General Hospital and asked for their help. But the emergency room staff turned her away, turned Charlie away. I was appalled when I heard that. I was oblivious to the emptying pews around me. I was just focused on Karen. I said, what, you mean they wouldn't help him? She shook her head and said, they just let him die. The nurse said, they don't treat Indians. Well, after that, Karen sat with the corpse of her little boy at a bus stop near the hospital. She sat there till morning until a Maori found her and actually arrested her, and then she was charged with manslaughter in the death of her own son. No one believed that it was the hospital that had killed Charlie. It's how they treat us here, Karen explained, after she calmed down a bit. It's always been that way for us, but they're not going to kill this one, she said, and she patted her swollen belly. Well, everything changed after that day. For me, especially. The thrones in my mind began to topple for me. I opened my heart and my door to many more of Karen's people and to the legions of other murdered Indian children that still lie in unmarked graves up at the United Church Alberni Indian Residential School. And that change spread from me and around me. It eventually began a political and a spiritual firestorm across Canada and across the world that's begun to overthrow a genocidal church and state system and turn everything upside down. Well, many centuries ago, there lived a woman a lot like Karen Connerly. She too was unwed, poor, outcast. She too was pregnant with a child and with a revolution, a new presence in the world that would make the last first and the first last. The woman's name, of course, was Mary, and she was chosen to bring Jesus the Christ into the world. Well, today's gospel reading from Luke chapter 1 speaks of that revolution. It's often called the Magnificat. Unfortunately, the Christian Church has surrounded this tale with a lot of cultic imagery and belief about a so-called virgin mother of God. But Mary was not a virgin. A church, the Church only calls her that because of a Latin mistranslation of the Greek word for young woman. Very young woman. Because Karen was a teenager, so was Mary. They were likely very young. Mary was as poor and as human as Karen Connerly and as human as Jesus himself. Mary sung a praise that in today's gospel, we read in today's gospel reading, is like John the Baptist's announcement that we heard last week about the coming of Jesus. This song of praise is intended to prepare people for Christmas and the imagined Bethlehem birth narrative, but once again, myth gets in the way of fact. Because as we know, Christmas has nothing to do with Christianity. December 25th was the Roman festival called Saturnalia, otherwise known as the time for reversal. For on that day, the slave owners would take off their robes and be the servant to their slaves, who would become the masters, for the day at least. That's no accident. The same great reversal, the turning of the world upside down, is at the core of Mary's song of praise. By naming Saturnalia as Jesus' birth date, the earliest Christians were saying, this is the consequence of the justice that Jesus has ushered into the world. All the rulers are pulled down, and the poor everywhere are raised. Now, pull down, that phrase in Greek, the Greek word for that is katareo, which means to utterly destroy, to obliterate, so they're not there anymore. Rulers of one over another, the rule of one man over another, is obliterated. Well, clearly by that, It's obvious that a radically new world is coming into being for a purpose not so obvious at first. It's often been said that the best way to tame a revolutionary idea is to turn it into a religion. Well, that's certainly happened with Christianity, because if you merely worship someone, you don't have to take them seriously. And so the radical message of Jesus, of human equality and liberation, was quickly contained and mythologized by the wealthy corporate church of Rome 
into a cult ritual that really smothered the power of Jesus' words and message. That religious cult killed the memory and spirit of Jesus and made him a sacrificial atonement for so-called human sin, a heresy called Roman Catholicism that, like all worldly empires, creates shame and humiliation in people in order to control them. But that degrading spirit is the opposite of what we hear today in Mary's triumphant song of praise. Her song is imbued with a force that breaks apart oppression and elevates humanity above itself. It shows us that even in our loneliness, we are chosen to fulfill a higher purpose and remake the world according to divine justice. Well, not surprisingly, as you can imagine, I used to get in trouble with my staid theology professors about this gospel reading. Its revolutionary message was not obvious to them as it was to me. In fact, it frightened my profs because, like Jesus' overturning of the money chambers, changers in the Jerusalem temple, it was outside their experience and went against their perceived interests. Richard Leggett was a particularly fat theologian who taught me Bible studies, and he used to get mad at me. He'd say, no, no, these texts can't be taken literally. Mary didn't literally mean the rich when she said they were, they were sent away hungry. It's a spiritual allegory. She meant anyone who's inwardly impoverished and toppling rulers from their throne. Well, that's just a reference to Satan, not to earthly rulers. <laughs> well, I remember answering him, well, then how about when Jesus says that a rich man can no more enter heaven than a camel can pass through the eye of a needle? Doesn't that mean it's impossible for the rich to go into heaven? <laughs> well, Big Dick smiled at me smugly, he always quick with an answer, and he said, No, the eye of the needle refers to a little-known gate in Jerusalem. It's small, but you can still crawl through it if you try. How convenient. And on and on ad nauseum. Over the years, I've learned that belief for most Christians is determined not by their faith as much as by their salary and pension plan. Fortunately, Jesus didn't have either. Well, to illustrate all this and to go deeper in today's gospel message, let's examine its key words from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55, if you want to follow along. Mary's first words in this passage are telling. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Well, the words in Greek for soul is psyche, which means substance or breath. And the word for magnifies is megaluno, which means to declare or to make greater or better. My soul magnifies the Lord seems to be saying that Mary herself is somehow making God better. She's making God more than God. Mary is the subject of the sentence. God is the object. Mary is acting upon God and perhaps on the Godness within herself. But then the rest of the passage seems to reverse that. It has Mary saying that God is choosing her to bring down the mighty and elevate the poor despite their lowly status. But this is ultimately Mary's song, and the first words situate Mary as the cause of everything that follows. It's amazing. Well, let's avoid the temptation of interpreting that meaning to somehow cultify Mary into godlike status, as the Church of Rome has done. In fact, what's being described in Luke 1.46 is fully human and reveals the majesty of being fully human. If there is divine greatness in our world, it is because of the courage and the witness of the human soul. The mystery called God has taken flesh in every child born and awaits like a seed in us to flower into the life of one like Jesus, who by being fully human was fully divine. Well, when you think about it, it's an incredible revelation. It puts an end to religion and to the world as we know it, where we're expected to always defer to some other authority figure and wait upon salvation and meaning to be delivered by somebody else. That evolution away from that childhood notion into godness within, understanding of our wider place in the world. That evolution is evident when you simply read through the Bible, the way it progresses. I mean, isn't it evident from a complete reading of the Bible that we are already in a direct and unmediated relationship and partnership with the great mystery that we call God? Because as it progresses, God, the idea, the impression of God, and perhaps the nature of God changes. He evolves from a vengeful, judgmental ruler into a state of unconditional love. Well, in the same way that that child matures from self-absorption and understanding, 
Our soul journey as a people is bringing to birth a better divinity through our willingness to accept the risk and the cost of being human, of existence. The mystery grows and evolves through us as we become more than ourselves. The ancient Greek writers and the person who authored the book of Job depict how man rises above God by persevering in the truth, whatever the cost, despite our mortality, despite our weakness. The Greek playwright Aeschylus wrote, the gods look with envy upon man because although living for but a day, he surpasses the Olympians by still daring to love and to be valiant. It's beautiful and it's all true. Like Karen Connerly and every woman who courageously brings forth life into a world of suffering and death, Mary sings in triumph because she knows that whatever comes, she's created a chance for all of us, the possibility of a new world where the old corruption is toppled. And perhaps her particular joy was to know that her own son would bring about that new way by lighting a fire and a sacred spirit in humanity that would never go out. Karen Connerly's New Chalmuth people have a story that once Christ visited their West Coast tribes, many centuries before the whites ever appeared. The Christ who came to them as a woman warned the New Chalmuth that a pale people would come to their land carrying her name and words, but they would lack her inner spirit, her teachings. The teaching that said that all of God's creatures were to be loved and respected and treated equally. Well, the Christ told the Nuchelnath that the pale Christians had lost that soul. And so they were to welcome them and lead them back to her true way. The Nuchelnath tried to do so, and they were slaughtered for it, just like Jesus was. But as with him, that spirit cannot be killed by cannon fire or smallpox or by big money. That promise rests within all of us. It's immortal. It waits to be born fully human and remake our world by first turning upside down everything inside us, and around us. Well, the week after I was fired by the United Church for uncovering its crimes against her people, Karen Carnerly came back. She appeared in my church one final time. She had heard what had happened to me and she came there to support me. But when she saw that I was no longer there in the pulpit, she stood up in the service and she declared, you're crucifying Kevin the, just like you did us, but God sees what you're doing and you're going to come down. And at that point, Karen again was grabbed and finally, like me, evicted from St. Andrew's United Church. And soon after that, she was found dead. But crucifixions have never ended anything. What Karen predicted has come true, for by her courage she has birthed it into being. The rulers are falling, the dead churches are collapsing, and the silenced victims are standing up and speaking and reclaiming the world. Well, I've seen this revolutionary miracle. I know it to be true because I've helped birth it into being. I pray for all of you that you may come to know and give life to the same Magnificat, the divine word taken flesh among us, to topple the ruler of this world and to bring to being a new creation. This is Kevin Annett, Eagle Strong Voice. Remember, live it. Thank you.